This is Dave Arnold, your host of Crooking Issues, coming to you live from the heart of Manhattan, Rockefeller Center, Newsstand Studios, New York City. How you doing? Uh, got Stas, uh, the Hammer Lopez, as usual. Everything good? Yes. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Nice. Got uh, John here as well, back from vacation. Where were you, John? Dominican Republic. Oh, nice. Well, we'll talk about that in one second. We got Joe rocking the panels here. Hey, how you doing? Doing well. Doing well. Thank you. Busy full house. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, in Vancouver Island, we have, of course, Quinn. How you doing, Quinn? Please say you're there. Quinn's got this magic internet connection that there's one IP address because he has to Skype in, all right? He has to Skype in. And there's one magic IP address he can never call without dropping, even though he has like the fancy microphone and everything, and it happens to be our studio. So we work on it week to week. We'll see what happens. And uh, <laughs> in the, <laughs> we'll work on it, people. We, we, we do the best we can. Uh, and we have uh, in California, we got Jackie Molecules. How you doing? I'm great. Yeah. Uh, overcast day in L.A., which is like... Your version of a nice day on the East Coast. I mean, well, no, that's my version of a nice day in L.A. I mean, can I go there now and experience L.A. in a way that I would like it without that evil sun beating on me like like <laughs> Satan melting me on purpose? I mean, I mean, if if I could make it overcast in L.A. 100 percent of the time, I would tell Booker. I, I don't know. I would knock him out like Mr. T. Put him on an airplane. Remember Mr. T from A Team? Put him on an air, uh, airplane oh, yeah. and take him out there. He'd be like, "This isn't New York." I'm like, "Says who?" Says who? Says who? It's not New York. Look, it's overcast. And then, like, that'll be it. Be over. So, uh, Jack, I have this new idea. I'm going to introduce the guest right away, and then we can shoot the breeze. What do you think? In general. That way they can shoot the breeze yeah, with us. I love that. You like that? All That's right. Well, a great idea. All right. Yeah. Well, today's special guest is Michael Escanis. Uh, I've known you since, I don't know, like, no, 12 years or something like that, ever since... Uh, Back in the French culinary days, how you doing? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, for those of you that, I don't know, they, they don't know, uh, for years, Michael was the pastry chef. I met, met him when he was a pastry chef at Le Bernardin, which is, you know, of course, well-known, uh, depending on how many stars you give, three or four-star restaurant here in New York, known for fish. Fish. They do, they do fish. Uh, and uh, it's the most famous fish restaurant in New York. Anyway, uh, and then after that, went to uh, the Institute of Culinary Education, where I didn't talk to him for a while because, of course, they were our mortal enemies back when I was at the FCI. But, of course, you know, in the in the Highlander battle of uh, freaking, you know, there can be only one in the New York, FCI lost and ICE won. So there is no more FCI, and ICE bought uh, FCI. It was a slap in, in our faces. But what do, what, do you, what do you think about that? Uh, you know, I mean, I, I was actually kind of sad to hear it, you know, because it was a great space. Um, I mean, we all love Dorothy. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, time marches on, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you're like that Sparta dude who just like kind of kicks us into that pit. I mean, to, you're like, to, I, I pity you. Boom. Like to be that. honest, I, I think most of the faculty now are all the... The holdovers from FCI. I know. You have a lot of good people yeah. there. You have like, well, hold on a second. So like we didn't shoot the breeze. So now we have to go back oh, okay. and shoot the breeze before we get into it. So call, if you're listening live on Patreon, call in your questions to 917-410-1507. That's 917-410-1507. Call us with all of your pastry or bean to bar or having worked in several cities in the United States kind of a situation or what it's like to work at a three-star Michelin restaurant or for New York Times, depending on what you care more about, whether you like the, what was that guy's name? The the Michelin man? What's in Billimbo? Bim, B, B, bim, bop. What's his name? Bill, Bill, Bill. Bibendum. Bibendum. Yeah. What the hell does that mean, John? I don't know. It sounds Latin. It sounds fancy. Biben, bibendum. Bibe, I say it in French, though. Does it sound better in French? Bibendum? Not really. No, no. no. It's just as. Bibendum, yeah. It's just as. Yeah. 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 And who has white tires anyway? It's true. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. I mean, maybe even way back in the white walls. White wall tires. Yes. Yeah. White tires? What is this? My BMX bike from 1980 freaking two? Come on, guys. So now we're going to shoot the breeze, Michael. That's how mm -hmm. this works. Uh, so uh, how was the DR? I've never been. Oh, it was very nice. What yeah, you, yeah. great, what, great what, weather. Uh, Punta Cana. Yeah? Uh, yeah, it was, it was good. I don't know, it was my girlfriend's birthday, so we went to this all-inclusive resort down there, and it was my first time doing that. It was very nice. Ooh, all-inclusive. Makes me nervous because I don't know how the quality of the food's going to be. Because Not it's, great. Yeah. But... It's all you can eat, so get a little sampling at the buffet, all you can drink if you're into that. So, like, when you say all you can eat, like, is it, like, uh, put it on a level I can understand in America, the, where the bottom level, no offense, is going to be Golden Corral, 
and like the top level because I've never been to a b- buffet in in Vegas. Oh by yeah, the, way. The, the the Caesar's Palace buffet is pretty excellent. I've never been to it, but like a like a Cherescaria kind of a place. So like in that kind of range, where are you? Probably in the middle. So like lower than a Cherescaria, but or lower than, than Vegas. I don't know. Again, I've never Vegas, been to Vegas is really good. I'll I'll say I enjoyed that All a right. lot. I had nine plates of food when I was there. It was quite good. So above Golden Corral though. Yes, definitely. Did yeah, they yeah. have a poorly run soft serve machine with really crystally bad base coming out of it because that's what i remember from golden no. i ate a lot of it though they had really bad uh hibachi bad hibachi yeah everything was viciously overcooked and they didn't even do the onion volcano which is very wow disappointing. yeah well just you know i've never had an onion volcano can you describe well, the onion volcano i mean it's nothing to really eat it's more just to, for the show but i don't know they kind of like take a thick slice of onion and stack them one on top of each other so it looks like a volcano and then they fill it with a little sake or mirin or something like that and set it on fire and smoke comes rushing out and then a little flame and then it just sort of pitters out it doesn't sound so delicious though no it's again for for visuals but hibachi is about the show okay mostly don't forget about the beating heart john oh the beating heart Uh, what's the beating heart the fried rice that they shape into a heart and what do they do jack they put the spatulas under and kind of like tap it up and down so it looks like a beating heart yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, very ridiculous. I do not understand what you guys are telling me. Just go to a Benihana, man. Yeah. I've never go been to a Benihana. Benihana. I've never been to a Benihana. But can I tell you this? Have I That's said this terrible. on air before? My mom, when she was in the ER once, like young, I think before she, like it was a rotation maybe in med school because she's pediatric, so she would never see an adult normally, right? A Benihana, a Benihana chef came in <laughs> with their finger almost oh, completely yeah. severed. Oof. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Wow. Sweet. Now, at an all-inclusive resort like that, do you do, like, excursions, or are you you prisoner? can those, yeah. you, you can do excursions. It's for an extra fee, of course, but I don't they have, like, a bunch of that's, things. That's not too far from prime cacao growing. That's true. Right. I don't think they had anything like yeah. that, unfortunately. Yeah, not very food-centric, so, but so that would have been very nice. You have to spend extra money for them to not serve you the food that they have prepared for you? Well, to, if you want to leave the site, you have to pay extra money for that. But otherwise, if you're what the at the resort, oh, everything wow. is free. What the hell is what well, the free. hell? What the is that normal? How does that? If know. you want to leave, you pay extra. That sounds like prison. You know what I mean? Like what? Yeah, but you don't really want to leave because everything right. is right there for you. Okay, everything. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, speaking of uh, going back for a second, am I the only person? I just want to know the level of the room. Am I the only person here that's eaten in a golden corral? I think so. I think so. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, that used to be the thing. Grandma and Grandpa would take me right when that sucker opened up at like five. Would be there. Yeah. Okay, that's just me then. Uh, so, John, why don't you tell them how they can join the Patreon if they would like to? Patreon dot com slash cooking issues, and there's a bunch of great, or, you know, three different levels of membership where you get different perks at each level. Uh, if you sign up, you get discounts to Kitchen Arts and Letters, uh, discounts to Maiden, and Grove and Vine for olive oils and all these great things from the guests that we have on the show. So, you know, the membership kind of pays for itself, really. Yeah, anytime we have a guest on the show, we try to get a little, uh, we try to get a little kicker for our, uh, for our Patreon folk. If they have something to kick. If they have something to kick. I'm not saying that you have to kick us something, Michael. That's not how this works. It's not, it's not pay-for-play situation. Uh, although, wouldn't that be nice? That would be, yeah. It would be nice. Uh, all right. So, uh, also, I'm going to say, uh, Andrew, hi. I thank you for the book on chafing dishes. I have not gotten to read it yet because the last week you haven't chafed me, booked it, but I had other things to chafe other than my dish uh, during the past week. However, John and I tasted your toothache plant cachaça, and what was our verdict, John? Um... Could uh, not 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 my cup of tea. What's it for, Andrew? Okay, so for those of you that don't know, like like one of the things you do with cachaça is you soak you soak crap in it, right? So you know I've seen it with whatever. Sometimes like animals, like there's people will do like snakes and weird things. Right. And people will do fruits like cashew apple or like uh, you know I don't know whatever you've seen you've seen these right, Michael? Yeah. You've seen these things around and. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this one is this toothache plant, which I don't know, but apparently they sell it at the at the green market here in Union Square. You ever use this stuff? I've tasted it. What do you think about it? Um, I, I think I think it's in the more interesting than delicious category. There you go. Yeah. This is what they think about you. This is what they think about you. For those of you that know Ice Cube. Anyway, the uh, like I, I, I'm going to taste it again, but I have to say, poisonous tasting. 
poison is tasty. Uh, like I'm trying, you, I'm trying to imagine what we would use it for other than as like a Malort situation. For those of you that don't know, Malort is the uh, Chicagoan version of a Basca Drapar, which is a hardcore bitter wormwood shot. I enjoy it. Malort? I enjoy it. I got some. Like with you right now? Not with me right now, but I do <laughs> uh. have it at the house. I had some Chicagoans. Is that how you say it? I don't know. Um, uh, uh, bring me some because it was this fabled, legendary bitter drink, and I love bitter drinks. You love bitter drinks? Yeah, I like Malort. I got a. F- <laughs> I like it too. Okay, Jesus. All right. Uh, if I ever get the legit again, like if I ever go to Sweden again, I'm going to get you some of the, like the, the, the real, like, Baska Drapar stuff. You know what I mean? It is not to be sneezed at. Uh, we, I had some that I forget who brought it for me, but we used it. It was a very specific size, so it was a perfect rolling pin for I forget what we were doing, but I always <laughs> used it as a rolling pin and not as a, uh, a liquor. Michael, can we talk rolling pins for a minute? Uh, sure. Do, are you a rolling? Do you like? I mean, uh, that's not what you do. Mainly you work with chocolate now, but do you I mean like were you ever like a rolling pin fellow? I, I mean, sure, as a pastry chef. Right, that's I, I, I don't know that I had strong opinions. No? I mean, I'm a, I'm a French pin guy. French pin. So describe non-tapered. a French pin. Non-tapered French non-tapered. pin. Non-tapered French pin. Non-tapered. Okay. Just, well, yeah, why? Just, um, just more surface area, more contact. Contact. Yeah. Who else, who else here is a rolling pin person? John, you a rolling pin person? I know yeah. Stas hates that crap. Right, Stas? You hate a rolling pin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm putting words in your mouth, but anytime I ask her a question about baking, she's like, I don't bake. What are you talking about? My, yeah, my, baking is hard. It's not that hard. You just don't like it, right? Yeah. Lots of things are, I mean, it's not hard. You just have to like it. Anyway. So, John, uh, what kind of pin do you use? I'd probably have to agree with Michael. You like a, you like a, that's the, first of all, those pins are heavy. They're, they are, yeah. They're, how big is that? That's like an inch and a half, maybe? Inch, uh, inch, and, half? inch and a half to two, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the untapered ones are typically made of like, I don't know whether they're maple or beech or whatever they are, but they're heavy. Yep, like yeah. they are a weapon. Like you could very club somebody club the club the ever loving hell out of somebody. And what is nice, I have to say about those pins, they're usually relatively long. They uh, they don't cut into the edge because you never really go off the edge of them because they're pretty long. And they also discourage you from um, they discourage you from a particular kind of bad rolling pin technique because you can't just wrap your hands around and go like an idiot. Right. You know what I mean? Well, I, you know, one thing I always I always try to teach people, a lot of people use a rolling pin and turn it to jazzercise. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you do that all day long. That's a lot of energy you're expending. Right. So I, I always teach people, roll in one direction and then turn your dough 90 degrees. And that way you're also ensuring that whatever you're rolling isn't sticking to your surface. Right, right. Now, now, now hear me out on the taper for a second, okay. right? Because at, at home, I use a relatively, you know, for years, I use a relatively lightweight tapered French pin, mm-hmm. right? But uh, not a great one, right? But okay, you know what I'm saying? And uh, then I started, you know, you know the past year or so, I've been trying to make chapatis work, right? So, you know, chapatis are the Indian flatbread, high hydration, Right, they use atta flour. Atta flour is extremely finely ground, so that it can absorb a lot of water. Uh, whole wheat it absorbs a lot of water. So it's, it's even though it's a dry dough, it's like seventy two percent, seventy three percent hydration. So mm-hmm. wet for how dry it feels. All right, you you flour it, and then you got to roll it. If you don't roll it thin enough, and if you don't roll it evenly enough, or if you tear it, then you have to cook it one side, cook it the other side, flip it, flame it, puffs. Right? You with me? Boop. Boop, boop, puff. Yeah. And if it doesn't puff, it sucks. Right. Right? No puff sucks. And it's not just a matter of of it if it, it doesn't puff so you feel like bad. It doesn't taste as good if it doesn't puff. Right. The texture's wrong. Anyway. So I started rolling, and I started doing the old thing where I would roll it, and then I would turn it, roll it, turn it, roll it, turn it, flip it, roll it, turn it. And then I just watched a bunch of videos, and I realized that if you use a tapered pin— and you, I could probably do it without a tapered pin at this point because I practice a lot, but a tapered pin helps you get this down more. I don't need to touch it to get it to rotate anymore. Mm-hmm. I can just go, bip, 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 and it spins underneath me while I'm rolling because I push on one side as I go up and the other side as I go back. And the thing just, I, I can choose. Mine are usually, I'm a counterclockwise spinner, 
right? I haven't tested it on pie doughs yet. That's the next move. But I've been I've been I've been doing you know reliably you know what is that eight or ten inches or yeah. so yeah. yeah eight to ten inch discs real thin real even because you're not rolling in one spot without ever touching the dough and it feels fantastic. And I'll, I'll grant you for for a smaller piece yeah, yeah. that those those tapered pins they're super nimble. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I'll yeah. grant you that. But yeah. if you're doing like lamination, uh, yeah. you want that battle axe of a of a pin. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. All right. Uh, when you see a student uh, mistreat a pin and dent it because they're a butthead, does it make you angry or no? I mean, I mean, we could we could sit here for an hour and just list those things that we see that just make us cringe yeah. for sure. Well, here's the other thing about a pin, right? There's two modes of thought on it. Not to go too deep on pins, but we already have, so I might as well just go all the way, right? You could either have a very smooth pin, which is not going to have a lot of traction on certain items, but I think that's actually fine. Or you can have a tacky, like a, like a like a less, like not a wax. You know how they have the wax surface pins? Yeah. And they have the ones, they're more like bowling pins, right, feeling? And then they have the ones that are like kind of like a little bit rougher wood. And I was always a little bit rougher, but I'm more of a smooth guy now. I'm more of a smooth, shiny guy now. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. I think people need to think more about their pins. I, you've got me thinking more about it now. Yeah, there you go. Uh, how the hell did I get into that? Why, why are we even talking about that? Why are we talking about pins? We were talking about Dominican Republic. and So? How did that get there? I, I, so you're trying to find the Lord. Malort. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Oh, I used the Malort as a rolling pin. There you go. Not a good rolling pin, by the way. Bottles don't make good rolling pins, people, because uh, they're just not. They, just, I mean, it, it's an in a pinch kind of a situation. Right. You know what I mean? In a pinch. You do a lot of lamination these days, Michael. Um, I have actually. I'm, I'm one of the many projects I'm working on. I'm, I'm helping to open a bakery out in Dallas, Texas. Oh yeah. So You've never been to Dallas. I will be going soon. Do you own a uh, Western hat yet? I don't, nor, nor do I have cowboy boots. Mm, I would get the hat first. Yeah. Although, I don't know, it's me. I don't uh, wear sunscreen, so I wear hats when I go out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you get yourself a, a resist all when you're down there. Get yourself, you know. Stas, what do you like more? Like, a, a, you like more of a, uh, uh, what's, what's it called, a... Like a straw, like a like a like a stiff straw hat, or you like more like the 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 felt hat, the the fur felt hat, or neither. Uh, neither. No, oh, come on. Yeah, I'm not a hat guy, but I don't know. I, I was very thankful at the age where I could be like, "Don't care. I'm wearing this hat. Suck it." You know what I mean? I mean, I, I think I'm getting to that age yeah. in general. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Nice to not care. Uh, <laughs> all right. Now uh, we do have some questions. Let me see. Uh, from Dale Van Groff. Uh, thrilled to hear you're on the show, Michael. I loved your bean to bar class, by the way. So one of the things that you teach is bean to bar chocolate, right? Yeah, so that's been since about 2015 when, when the school moved from 23rd Street down to Battery Park City. Um, we had about 500 square feet of extra space, and we said, hey, let's do a bean to bar chocolate lab. Um, so it's, I'm not going to say we're the only facility doing bean to bar education, but we're one of the very few in the country. Um, so yeah, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, you're going to make chocolate or focus on chocolate from a manufacturing perspective, I would have said why. Um, but now that's at least half my life. Well, who was the first kind of like pastry chef gone chocolate maker? Jacques Therese way back in the day? Yeah. And you know, he never made a ton of his own. Right. Um, but well, he, he never claimed in, to though. He never claimed to. No, no, no. But, but you know, I, I've also become a student of, uh, um, New York City chocolate history, like specific to New York City. And I kind of think he may have been the first one to start making chocolate um, in Manhattan at King Street, I believe. Well, he um, started in, first in Brooklyn across the river in Dumbo. Right, but I don't, think, I don't think that that had the, the heavy equipment. It wasn't as big, yeah. right, when he moved into King Street. Didn't he have like a little concert and all that stuff? Wasn't he doing stuff? In but but I, but I want to say that he would have been really one of the first people to manufacture chocolate in the confines of New York City in about 40 years. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the last big holdout was in the 1960s. Who was it? Uh, it was a company called Rockwood. At their height, they were second to Hershey 
Mm. like in the 1920s and 1930s. And they were there. Actually, there's a few buildings still standing. Um, if you're cruising down the BQE, say from Williamsburg into Dumbo, and just as you're kind of in the area of the Navy Yard, if you look to your right, you'll see um, the, the former Rockwood factory. It's, it's apartments now. I take exception to the idea that anyone can cruise down the BQE. Okay. Well, I mean. <laughs> when you stopped in traffic <laughs> on the BQE... Yeah, yeah. I hate the BQE so much. There's one, you know what? There's one really nice thing about the BQE. Do you travel on the BQE a lot? You know, I live in Sunnyside now, so a lot of times to get to Lower Manhattan, that's how I'll get there. You ever go to Coluccio's, which is near Sunnyside? Coluccio Brothers? I haven't actually. You need to go to Coluccio Brothers. Uh, do you ever? Do you ever? Do you? Is your family? Are you a, a salt cod family at all? You would think with my, uh, like, Baltic, Eastern European, um, but no, that was not something I discovered until I started cooking professionally. Yeah. They, they have the best salt cod selection really? I have ever seen in the United States. I mean, other places you can go. They have great salt cod selections. But around Christmas time, you go to Coluccio's, and they have, like, full sides of like various different kinds of cod nice. salted down. And they'll sell you a little piece, but they really want to sell you the whole of course. freaking, oh my God, so awesome. And then you do everything. You do the bacala, you do the brandad, you do the, of course, yeah. you know, you do like salt fish dishes from the Caribbean. You do them all because you have so much salt cod. You know what I mean? And it doesn't go bad. It doesn't go bad. And then, you know, you know what the, my, my thing with the salt cod is, is that like, um, so <clears throat> the family that, my, my stepfather's family is Italian. I grew up with that, right? Um, and we grew up Christmas Christmas Eve. You had the the, mm. the fishes, right? And the bacala was one of them. But that dish requires really thick, nice, hardcore quality cod because you're you're eating it as big chunks, right? Right. And then it's like, don't let it boil. Don't ruin the bacala. You have soak it for days. You know what I mean? But I really, as a when I cook at home, I like to buy the cheaper thinner stuff because you can use it the same day that you try to do it and like it's just much easier for sure. a lot of like you know like you know saltfish mashed into like you know yams and like name and whatever or like you know in dishes or like fritters did you have any bacalitos when you were down there john nope <sighs> it's disappointing on the local food front yeah yeah i know good I know. fruit yes very good fruit good papaya good pineapple great mango things like that wait wait good good great uh, papaya was great, mango was great, pineapple was okay. I mean, good, but like I've had better, but it was still very good compared to what we get here. Well, I mean, like papayas in the United States are the worst fruits. Like, I don't understand why anyone uses papaya here. I don't understand why people sell it. I don't I, like, like, you know, I've had kids. I know what diapers are like. Like, I don't need an American papaya in my life. Yep. I just don't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know. In Colombia, obviously, mm. they have that phrase, you know, no dar papaya, right? Don't don't give papaya because their papaya. I'm like, why would you say that? Like, I'll give every papaya away. I'll give them all away. And then you have their papaya, and it's like, oh, this is good. This is a good fruit. It is a good fruit. Yeah. Do you like papaya, Michael? But I I, I do feel the same way. I even uh, guavas that you get here typically are very disappointing oh. as well. The other thing about a guava, it's just one of those fruits that it should have more than one name. It's like it's like if you called an apple and a pear the same freaking thing. Sure. They're both, you know, papples. No, like, yeah, like guavas. There's such a range in guavas, and yes, they're all mostly crappy here. Yeah. Same with soursop. Don't you wish soursop was better here? Flavor, I love. I oh, love that soursop. So good. The purees and oh, okay then. I've not had. So one of the things that Michael does, I forgot, is he is a brand ambassador. Is that true? It's true. Brand ambassador for. A boiron. Now that John can say with some serious French accent. Give me some boiron. Oh, uh -huh. very good. Yeah. So, uh, what's it like working for big puree? Um, it, it's it's fun actually, um, because it, I think what's most interesting for me, especially in the context of all the time I'm spending in chocolate world, where the future is a big topic, sustainability, all that stuff, um, is seeing where where boiron as a company is is taking that. You know, because if you think about it, it's kind of a messed up idea. We're buying fruit from the best place where it grows. We're buying mangoes from India. We're shipping it to France to process, and then we're shipping it again somewhere else. But it's on a boat, right? It's not that inefficient because sure. it's on a boat. Sure. But 
they're thinking about right. how do we fix that? How right. do we make that, you know, more sustainable for the future? And do, I think. Do you get to go to the harvest place? Did you get to go to Kerala or wherever in India they are? I, I, I'm hoping uh. that as I spend more time with them, um, that's in the cards. Certainly next time I go to France, because a lot of their stone fruits come from locally in the Southern Rhone Valley. Is that how they started? That's how they started. They sold produce at the Rungi market outside of Paris. Oh, man. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. I bought uh, some bad truffles there. Not bad, but like, you know, cut rate truffles. Sure. Rungis. Yeah. Anyway. Good times. Yeah. Great times. Yeah. You, ever, you like that market? You gone there? I've been there once. And, and it was, you know, it's one of those things that's like so huge. Yeah. At least you've been to uh, Tsukiji. Yeah, well, and, the old, yeah, yeah, whatever it so, was I mean, back that in the day. seems more manageable. I don't know. Nastasi and I almost got killed there well, several times. Like the guys driving the little... Remember that, Stas? Yeah. It was awesome, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to have situational awareness when you're there. Yeah, everyone's like, I need to see the tuna auction. We're like, I don't care. Just let me see the whole damn thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Never seen so much styrofoam in my life. True. Yeah, so much. To- oh, did you go there when you were working at Bernie's house? I actually went there. It was a... a project that they were they ran it for a few years they would take a group of new york pastry chefs right and just basically do a pop-up in japan for a week uh so who did i go with i went with bill yasis oh nice uh mark omo from uh then at the modern now at gabrielle kreiter uh deb rasikat who at the time was, was she still at aquavit maybe um yeah cool group of like four or five of us and we we basically did a pop-up in a department store in osaka for a week oh my god how was that yeah, it was a blast yeah when yeah. they when, when nastasi and i did our pop-up at the park hyatt they were let's just say price insensitive to the ingredients it was amazing oh yeah and we you know we didn't have to touch anything i mean they they we assembled some things in front of people for show but oh they made us <clears throat> crank the drinks out or right, stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, they had I mean it was like kind of nestled between the Cartier counter and the Prada counter. They had full cases. Um you know, it was a uh, a company that that runs like 20 pastry shops in all right. the various depachica throughout the country. Um they did all the prep. We sent them recipes. Everything was perfect, beautiful. Nice. I need to go back. Stas, we need to go back. Yeah. Anyway, uh, all right. So let me finish this question from Dale. It's about bean to bar chocolate. Yes. All right. Now, first of all, your bean to bar program. Do you? Okay, maybe you should just talk about the like, short history of bean to bar. Like, is Chocolate Alchemy still a good place to go for people? The website, or is there they've been surpassed? Like, what's going on? Like, why don't you describe the 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 movement of bean to bar amongst smaller producers and individuals at home? Sure. Um, the way I usually like to explain it is, if you were to go back fifteen years ago. Uh, there were maybe half a dozen small scale chocolate makers in North America. Um, you had your Amano. Um, I would even say guitar is still kind of like artisan industrial, right? So yeah. they're, like um, the po- they're like the polar beverage of chocolate. Sure, sure. So you had half a dozen small scale chocolate makers really inspired by what Scharfenberger started in the 90s, even though by that time they were already acquired by Hershey. Um, you know, I'm kin to Hershey. I did not know that. Yeah. Milton Snavely Hershey. Great, cool. great, great uncle. Died in 1945. Already sold the business. Don't have the money. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, yeah. Around 2006, 7, 8 is when you started to have this real explosion in craft, bean to bar, artisan, specialty chocolate, whatever you want to call it. Um, and depending on who you ask today, in North America, there's probably five or 600 small chocolate makers. Um, What's small to you? I mean, that, that's actually an interesting question because the, the, the industry itself is trying to define what that means. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, I start to think of, you know, three, four, five tons is still small a year. Um, but even some of the bigger ones are exceeding that. Um, they're probably 10, 10 tons and over. Um, I mean, that, that's really the sort of existential crisis of, of what craft chocolate is defining itself. Um, is it the approach? Does it have to be done by hand? Does it have to be ground in stone? Because a, a lot of these smaller companies are scaling up and they're moving to ball mills and rolling right. refiners and things like that. So it's, it's, it, there are interesting conversations happening, and I think a lot of people have their own opinions of what, the, what, what craft or artisan means. Um, 
Whereas, you know, we look at specialty coffee, we looked at craft brewing, they kind of have things defined. Um, and chocolate doesn't quite have that yet. Um, but yeah, it's an exciting time. It's still very exciting. I mean, do you I think mean, that stuff should be defined? I mean, do you care, do you care more about the product or do you care about whether or not the, you know, it's two stones rolling on a third stone? I mean, I personally don't, um, but it's helpful for consumers because a lot of consumers still don't really understand that, that segment. They, they don't understand why that chocolate bar costs $10 or $15. Mm. So on that educational side, I think it helps to define yeah. You know, what, what, what this all means. Um, cause not all of it is great either. So if somebody, you know, shells out 10 bucks for a chocolate bar and they have a bad time, they're not going to, they're not going to go back. Right. So I know that Jacques Therese back in the day when he opened, not the original one in Dumbo, but the, the, the larger factory in, um, down, what was that? Tribeca or like, yeah, uh, yeah. House, like yeah. King street. So, yeah. Near, whatever. Like Houston, around yeah. There, yeah. Um, he said that one of the issues was it was very hard for anyone at his scale, right? And he was one of the few people doing it at the time mm-hmm. to get a hold of good raw material. Has that changed? That has totally changed. So how does so, it work now? So, um, I mean, the, the, the basic unit of measurement for cacao is still the 60 kilo bag. Um, so for your home enthusiast, that's not super convenient. Um, and it's just like hydrocolloids, right? Remember back in the day, the only way you could get your hands on that stuff is you had to, you know, request free samples. Yeah, yeah. And you would use a free sample for years. And, and then, but then they got wise to it, yeah. right? And they stopped. So it took, you know, the, the distributors and the suppliers to, okay, we're going to buy that 50-gallon drum and break it down into one-pound bags for you. That's starting to happen with cacao. Um, so, you know, I say with a, a few hundred dollars investment, you can get a tabletop melanger. Right. And you have access to the same cocoa beans that, all these other craft chocolate makers are using. Um, what about the access of those makers versus like a Valrona? I mean, Valrona is, is, is in country typically and they're working, you know, a lot of their, their growers are ex- exclusive to them, you know, so that's, that's just decades of relationships. But, you know, if you, if you were to go to a, a specialty chocolate store store um, and you see, you know, all the, all the, the origins they're using, Tanzania, Uganda, um, you name it. Chances are you can get those beans either through Chocolate Alchemy, as you mentioned, or another... Um, they, that's, they're who I learned this stuff from. Sure. Back I mean, he's, the he's, he's, he's the godfather of, of this movement, really, John, I mean, John and, Nancy. And how much did that... Because they were like, buy this, buy this wet grinder yep. from India that's not meant to do chocolate because it looks like a chocolate grinder, and yep. then do it, use it as your conch as well, do the whole thing. This was like in 2010, something like yeah. this, 28, something like that. And when we at the French Culinary bought like three of them because we started doing, you know, like just messing around with it. And to me, that site was a revelation. I don't know. Have they, has, have they helped even the larger scale people get access to these beans because brought more attention to it? Is it kind of like homebrewing, like you're saying, where actual homebrewers helped the craft brewing industry or no? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, th- I think he helped open it up. You know, there's another um, another source that I use based in Portland, Oregon, Meridian Cacao. So they're importers. You know, so you can buy full bags. You can buy a pallet from them, but you can also buy five, ten pound bags um, from them as well. So so that's starting to open up. And for for home people, is a uh, is a uh, is the wet grinder still the way to go? It's a great start, and I'm actually my one of my missions is to get them into more like restaurant kitchens wet grinders yeah i mean you're not gonna make all of your own chocolate although i think you should play around with it even if you're using nibs from your dry storage um play around with it so you get an appreciation for it but you could make something special for one dish you can make your own jandia you can make your own nut pastes i yeah no i love the wet grinder yeah. i love so, it so and they're, mustard and they're right john they're, yeah they're cheaper than a variable speed blender right so you can get them for like 300 couple, bucks yeah, yeah yeah if you wait around you can get them for even do you care whether it's a straight stone or an angled stone does it do you care at all i haven't really worked with the angled stones yet um, i only have straight stone yeah that's what i'm used to yeah but they work they just keep working they're very simple belt driven machines they yeah. just go i've never had one uh okay I've, I've worn through maybe one in the last six years but i've got half a dozen of them 
I leave them running for three days. Yeah. I sleep fine at night. They're great. Yeah. The one thing we used to have to do when we did chocolate was uh, off on, off on, off on to get the moisture to leave in the right amount. Hmm. But like, you know, and keep the temperature right. You know well, what I mean? I mean, as a, as, a, as a conch, it's not very efficient. Right. So, so you need heat and you need airflow. So people will set up rigs. You know, I set up a little desk fan, uh, which cools it down, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you hit, the, hit it with a heat gun. Periodically, um, I've also started to use a thermomix. No, oh my as, God, you're so fancy, of, so as, so as European. A, as, as sort of like a a conch when I've got you know a kilo or two. It's, it's, it's Do you not, like it as a conch? Is that a reason works. to own one? If you're gonna, it, I mean, I mean, you can use it for so many things. Europeans love them so much. Yeah, and you know what's what what was surprising to me is when they finally brought them to North America, they targeted home cooks. And that pros because that's what uh, it is in Europe. It's like all the chefs use it, but people have it at home. True, you know what I mean. Um, and they're expensive there, but Vita Preps are also expensive over there. Like yeah. Vita Prep costs like what a thermal mix costs. I mean, there. in my experience, all the chefs in Europe pined for Vitamix, and everyone here was you know trying to get their European thermal mix to work on our yeah you know, one ten yeah. Man, anytime a Europe, back when I was at the FCI, anytime a European chef would come through, do you have the thermal mix? We're like, no, no, it got stolen a year ago and we didn't buy another one. Come on, man. Right. I mean, come on. But yeah, I mean, those, those stone grinders are great. Um, and, and what we're, what we've seen in the last few years is all the people who started on those, you know, and they graduate up to the, you know, 50, 60 kilo is okay. Scaling up. It's very inefficient. So a lot of those early, craft chocolate makers have now started to grow into, you know, what some people feel is more industrial because it's metal. Right. Yeah. There is a, there is, there's this romance about stone. Well, I, so the next level up of stone one that like the old, like style melangeurs aren't inefficient. They're not very good. I mean, compared to roller refiners and ball mills and things like that, or, or universals McIntyre. Um, yeah. And, 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 and certainly, um, Do you like that Duchamp work grinding my own grinding my chocolate? Is that still a slang word in in French, John? I don't know. You know that piece on glass with a chocolate grinder? Oh yes, yeah. yeah I don't really like and it's a, it's a it's yeah. a uh, it's a self pleasuring reference in yeah. in uh, French. Yeah. yeah, I guess I never never caught onto that. Well, he you know he was like that Duchamp. Yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now that we've discussed, by the way. Do you still use for grinding the uh, nibs? Do you still use like a? I use like a champion. Is that still what people use, or what, what do they use? Anything? I, I, I personally, I thought that was like a completely unnecessary step. Just you throw it in and just let it go. Or, 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 or yeah, I mean, you, you, you add them, you know, slowly. Um, I, I mean, I also have larger scale equipment, mm -hmm. so I do have a, a like a hammer mill that right, I can right. produce liquor with. Um, but even just whizzing it up in a in a robo coup, right? Well. Save you an hour, and you can add it faster. Or Cuisinart also, for those of us that can't afford Robocus. Okay, <laughs> but I, I also use like uh, dehydrators right. as warmers. So warm bowl, warm stones, warm nibs, warm sugar. It makes everything go faster. What's the uh, do you do you bother pre dusting your sugar in a blender or no? Uh, I typically don't. I typically don't. Where are you on less than? Uh, I'm I'm pro less than if it's needed. Right. Um. You know, fluidity in chocolate, I think, is really important. And we're going to, apparently, we're going to talk about that in a minute. What, where right. are you on, uh, you know, for a while, there's that whole thing, like, I'm not going to add, I'm not going to add cocoa butter to it. I won't. What do you think? Again, my, my preference is for that, I guess, I guess I would call it a French style, a little bit of extra cocoa butter, uh, less than when it's needed. To me, it's, it's like, uh, I'm not the spirits guy that you are, but, you know, a, an ice cube and, and a glass of whiskey is going to make it open up, right? Am I, yeah, am I, am especially because it's too hot anyway. Sure. Yeah. In, in the same sense, you know, some people feel like if I'm adding cocoa butter, I'm diluting the intensity of the flavor. My opinion is if it makes it more fluid, it coats your palate, and, and the evolution, the length of the flavor is, is increased. You get more flavor release over time. So you actually taste more of it rather than just this kind of muddy chocolate sitting on your tongue. Right. Most cocoa butter is pretty bad. Do you use deodorized? Uh, sometimes I use deodorized. I have a cocoa butter press too. Um, 
Oh, so, they, so yeah, right. I saw it. It's awesome. So then you can use your own cocoa butter and then right. use and, it. And, and that's also an argument against adding cocoa butter because then for most people, that means it's no longer single origin. Right. Um, but if you can press the beans that you're making chocolate from. Do the hand oil presses, the little ones that for a couple hundred bucks for nuts, do they work for pressing? I mean, people say they work. I've never used them. You know, I've I always wanted I can't imagine things. what kind of yield you get. Because you know, my cocoa butter press, it's... You know, it takes 90 minutes at 75 tons of pressure to get, you know, 90% of the cocoa butter out of that liquor. So I, 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 I'm, I'm a firm believer in you, you don't get what you don't pay for. You don't get what you don't. Yeah. All right. So, so I, I'm skeptical, but I've never used them. What about roasting? What's the, what's the way to roast now? Um, I mean, when I've had a chance to play on like, uh, adapted coffee roasters, love it. Love yeah. it. Yeah. That was also something I picked up during the pandemic was ro- roasting coffee at home in little Beemores. Um, but I have a, a drum roaster uh, in the lab. So, you know, uh, dynamic roasting is always the way to go. Be, so You can make it work in an oven if you have to. But uh, is, there, is it similar to coffee? Is there an air versus drum debate? Um, I, I don't think you see as many people using... Um, the, the fluid... Are you talking about like fluid bed Yeah, roasters? like civet style... I think I think it's still early days. Like, why uh, wouldn't you? Is there a reason not to? I, I haven't personally worked with one, um, but I, but I think most people are still using drum roasters. Yeah. Huh. All right. Now to the question. Finally, after we've uh, laid the groundwork. Sure. Yeah. Um, thrilled to hear you're on the show. This is Dale Van Groff again. Mm. Right. Loved your bean to bar class, and I'm glad to hear it's back on. My question is on culinary education more broadly. Uh, so much has changed in the industry as a result of the pandemic, and there were tons of changes happening even before uh, that with technology, social media, and app-based delivery, just to name a few. What do you do differently than you used to in order to prepare your students for this brave new world of education? I guess of both as an educator and as a I'll, I'll add, as an educator and sending them into a different industry. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a whole different industry. Uh, and how have you and uh, ICE more broadly uh, evolved your professional development curriculum to help these those currently in the industry keep up? That's a lot to unpack. Um, I'll I'll take the last part first. Okay. Um, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, a lot of public facing stuff um, was slow to come back. So that would include our our professional development work, and that's really where my passion has been. Uh, I've never been faculty. I've never been in administration. I was just this weird guy. Working in his corner. You can relate, right? <laughs> well, at least you had a corner. Stas and I were in what, Stas? A closet. Trash room. Yeah, trash room, trash closet. Um, so that was always my my passion. And that started to come back. And that's really where the, the classes that we do in the chocolate lab, um, you know, it, it's for people who either are just curious or aspire to get into chocolate making. Um, so I'm happy to see that slowly starting to come back. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um just to try to be succinct, I, I think I, what I was already observing um, is that the average age of the student was getting younger. Huh. It almost feels like we're seeing them right out of high school, um, which when I started at ICE with you know no experience in education whatsoever, um, it seemed like it was a lot of career changers. And I, and I was led to believe that that had a lot to do with you know financial stuff happening in 2008, 9, 10. Um, you know, people would get their degree and spend a couple of years working in a law firm and realize, no, I want to cook. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I started to see that age skew younger. I also think what's interesting, and I, I don't know if this is good or bad, um, but I think, you know, if you were to pull an average class of students, fewer are probably having their sights set on working in, say, a fine dining restaurant. And a lot of them have this idea of what they, they already have an idea of what they want to do kind of on an entrepreneurial side. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, right. You know, they want to start a cake business or a cookie business or they want to make barbecue sauces or whatever. And they kind of feel they need to go through this program to, you know, to get a good base. Well, building on that, on the pastry side, like back when you were at Laberna, Dan was, I, I see if you agree with me, this is my opinion that I have, but maybe it's just because I'm not plugged into that part of the world anymore. But, like, that was kind of the golden age of the pastry chef. Like, uh, you know, the average well-informed diner in New York could name probably five pastry chefs at least, right? Not just people in the industry, like, anywhere. Like, they were getting the press. You know, you you were getting press. A bunch of people were getting press. 
and then and so that was like kind of a goal and then all of a sudden the goal became more again traditional kind of pastry things like you know what Dominique Ansel is doing at his bakery or like you say starting bakeries or going doing things and I don't hear as much press about people doing fine dining pastry anymore do you agree with that or what I, do you think kind of do I mean I I also kind of get get into my bubble um where I realize uh, I'm not really down with the scene as much as I used to be. I think, and, I, and I've talked to this with people recently, one of the things I think that is a factor is social media. Um, and, and also, if you, if you went back 10, 15, 20 years, um, it, was, it was fine dining was sort of what you looked at. Right. So you looked at who are the pastry chefs working in all these, these restaurants. And they were, you know, I wouldn't say they're household names, but yeah, whatever, they... they were known known entities. You were as likely to know the pastry chef as the chef in sure. a lot of places. Sure. Now I think, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, who 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 is important and influential uh, today? Uh, I'm sure we could both scroll through Instagram and just randomly see people with hundred plus thousand followers that are they they just cater to their little bubble. You can be really into a certain style of cake or a certain. You could be really into laminated pastries and there are superstars in that those little bubbles um you know so i i think that's part of it if that makes sense hmm. um but yeah i mean there are people out there working you know some, sometimes i people say there haven't been any pastry chefs since you and sam and alex and whoever I'm like right. no there have been people working they just we're not hearing about them through the, the I think the, the food media has also changed. Right. They're not getting the same light from the food media. I, yeah. don't think. I think that's true, though, right? They're not getting the same light from the I, I think so. Yeah. But, but does that then also change kind of who wants the job? Hmm. To someone who doesn't want that kind of a situation? Because for a while it was kind of you needed to be a certain kind of because you were getting a lot of. Not, not you in particular, but yes, you, also you in particular. But there was a certain like need to be out there in the same way that the savory side chef is often out there. Sure. Yeah. You I mean, I, I mean, <clears throat> I pretty much had my own PR rep for for the most part for yeah. for a few years. Yeah. Right, can, can I ask you something about LeBurn then? Yeah. So there's a famous kind of plate in LeBurn Dan that we used to call at the FCI. Remember Stas, the lady parts plate. Yeah. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like and I was there pretty recently, like pandemic, and they still have the lady parts plate. Because uh, it's for one dish. Okay, okay. But, but if you if you I mean if you just rotate it ninety degrees, it's it's a football. Sure. Now, did anyone and I remember the first time that that thing got put on the <laughs> on the social media the plate is a lady parts plate, and then what was plated on it right. was more lady parts. And uh, Stas and I were like, what the hell is this? I was like, "Did is this some sort of like, is like repair being punked, or does repair know? Like, was someone like, a uh, chef, uh, lady parts, right Stas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so Dave is re- referring to a, a uh, pounded tuna, so essentially like a tuna <laughs> carpaccio that's then draped over foie gras and, and all this stuff. I mean, yeah, that dish existed long before I I stepped foot in the place, and, and yeah. still to this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's something. Yeah, but do they know? I mean, I guess I never thought of it that way because I always <laughs> I always saw it presented as a football. So you're saying that all of these years they don't know. Still to this day. Know. All right. I don't know. We never had that conversation in any meetings. Okay. Brady Vickers wants to know, I followed your blog for years and would be interested to know if you uh, have ever considered writing again. Uh, I know I would be very interested in anything you wanted to share, and I wish all of those recipes were still available online. Your blog was quite nice. Did Thanks. you do all the little drawings and everything? Because you're an artist as well. You, I, that's what you did. I did in, everything. In, yeah. um, and that was kind of early, I mean, early-ish days. You know, so it was like, you know, who who are the... Who are the go-tos? I mean, stuff that you were doing, and, and Alex and Aki, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this was like, let's try to document what we do in the kitchen almost every day. Um, you know, and it's funny, because people will still approach me with, like, a printed-out, bound, you know, copy of all that stuff. I'm like, oh, these are these are now, like, 14 years old. Like, That's like, back when we would print the internet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. 
I mean, I've, 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 every few years I talk to a book agent, you know, and it's like to sell a book, especially now. I mean, it was even different 10 years ago when I first started having these conversations. Um, I don't know. I, I always refer back to the, it was it Churchill who said, you know, there's, there's enough bad books on the shelf. I don't need to add mine to them. Um, you don't, nobody needs my version of a chocolate chip cookie recipe. So how do you make it different? So yeah, as a chef, you, you want the coffee table book. I mean, I would like your version of it. What's your favorite chocolate, what style oh of chocolate gosh. chip cookie? I don't give me the recipe, but like, how do you like it? What is an ideal chocolate chip cookie to you? I mean, a lot of it is on timing. Right. So I still want it warm from the oven, slightly crispy, but, crispy. but soft, but I mean, only on the edges. How thin, how thin is this thing? I mean, I don't want it super thin, but I don't want like the... So you don't lump of undercooked dough, but you don't like it when like the, 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 it's so thin that the chips stand proud of the, of, of the thing. No, no, I want some, I want some, some bite to it, some body. So not like those kind of almost molassesy thin, you know what I'm talking about that style? Not, not for me. Yeah. But Um, not hyper puffy either. Not. And yeah. What texture does it have when it's cold? Not crispy. Like that's why I like it right out of the oven because you get a little bit of a crispiness, but it's still soft. Yeah, what about but like a completely like a like a, you know, like what what you buy at the grocery store, the soft bake. Like I hate those. Like yeah. so, it's got to have a little bit more. All right, let's do it. The money move for any. First of all, show me with your hands so that only the Patreon people can see. What's the ideal size of, of a chocolate chip? Are you one of these people? Or are you like a, like a more traditional home? Yeah, yeah, traditional. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the money move always people. And come on, if you don't know this, what the heck's wrong with you? Just toast cookies for a cup, for like a little bit, just a light toast on a cookie before you eat it. Yeah. And that brings its life back. Comes Absolutely. back to life. I used to do that in, even though we weren't allowed to use the conveyor toasters on cookies in college. <laughs> like the kind of like low yeah, end yeah. dining room cookies that we would get. I'd be like, I don't care what I'm allowed to do. This sucker's going in the conveyor toaster right now. And it comes out and then it just poof, breaks in your hand. Course, but, it, yeah. you know, but the outside is still a little bit firm as you want. That's the way to do a cookie. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, with the, with the book thing, like, um, yeah, I guess I, I, I have yet to, to find the, the, the concept or the topic that I could do exactly the way I wanted to do it. Um, I've, I've toyed with this idea because I've, I've gone so deep into chocolate manufacturing history in New York city, uh, which you can imagine like seven people are probably interested in, but I could give that. The They're all full, listening though. If I could, <laughs> if I could give that the full academic treatment, like that could be cool. Um, and I would love to do a project like that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, but there's so much great content out there. You know, if I did the the science and pastry approach, I, I don't know that I would have anything to add to what you know people have already already put up. Yeah, there. but that's not even true. That's not even true, though. I mean, like, like you might not want to do it, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, is you have a voice that's different from other people's voices, so there's always something to add, and Perhaps. people are always making new stuff. Uh, Johnny shakes right in, and uh, Quinn, are you back yet? Yep, I'm right. the Raven. All right, question for uh, Michael and me and Quinn. I own an ice cream shop, and although I have personally have no problems with them, we generally steer clear of gum slash emulsifiers as our customers prefer not to see those things on the ingredient list. We use tapioca starch as a thickener, which is an interesting one to use if you're going to use one. Yeah. Um, we use tapioca starch as a thickener, but that's pretty much it. Although I've had great success with pistachio. I love, I love the way Italians say pistachio. Pistachio. Uh, and black sesame ice cream. Peanut butter ice cream never turns out properly. I actually remember a video where Nick Morgenstern says that P- uh, PB is one of the harder flavors to make because they also don't use uh, stabilizers or emulsifiers. It's hard to describe, but it almost looks like wet sand when it comes out of the batch freezer. You know, nut pastes are hard with that kind of stuff because the oil can seize up when it gets that cold, right? But not in peanut butter, though. Anyway, I'll, I'll let me finish the question. If I add a zero point one percent guar, guar, it comes out. I love guar. Mm-hmm. Comes out beautifully. Uh, mostly just curious what's going on here, and if you have any possible "quote unquote" clean label solutions for the problem. Thanks. Hmm. Um, I don't know that I've ever really encountered that problem. Um, you ever frozen peanut butter into an ice cream? It does get. I mean, I have. It gets yeah. weird, right? It gets real I mean, solid. It depends on on your dosage. Um, you know, I find if you're adding it. 10 to 20 percent which is usually sufficient i don't really have a issue but are you also balancing your 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 milk fat i don't know because that's important um yeah they're doing um eight percent p 
peanut butter roughly, and I think it's 14% overall fat. So it's okay. maybe about 10% from milk and then like probably four from the peanut butter. Wait, I mean, so you had this information, you didn't give it to Michael. Nice. I mean, nice. That, that shouldn't <laughs> be a problem. Uh, uh, uh. That shouldn't be a problem, but certainly once you get, you know, so that that's like what the industry calls like super premium uh, in terms of fat content. I mean, yeah, an emulsifier is always a little helpful, uh, but it's also, I, you know. I, I wonder if, sorry, I wonder if it would work to start just from roasted peanuts, because if the sesame and pistachio work, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's also, you know, just basic technique. Are you homogenizing? And, you know, you don't need a homogenizer. I mean, an immersion blender will work in a pinch. But if is it properly homogenized going into the to the freezer? Um, but it shouldn't shouldn't cause a problem. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, one thing that I, I, I thought this was going to be a flavor question, actually. Uh, but but definitely when working with nut nut paste, don't be afraid of salt. Um, don't be afraid of salt generally. But I mean, in, in ice cream, some people just don't think of it. Yeah, they should, though. Yeah, they should. All right, Quinn, you got some questions, and John's got a question. We only got four minutes left. Get, get, get your questions in there. Get your questions in there, Quinn. What do you got? All right, um, John, are you, all right, I'll, go, I'll go first. Okay. Just for one. Um, you know, I do a lot of you know, frozen dessert pastry work. I really liked your recent post about those fruit gummies. Mm. Those looked really interesting. But I'm wondering, you know, my preference is always to concentrate and manipulate fruit or other sort of whole spices, whole botanicals. But do you ever lean to um, either like a essential oil or something like that? Because I'm starting to get curious about those ingredients for certain flavors. I mean, you know, there's, there's always, I, I, I'm, I never shun anything. Um, so if, if, if something can be improved and, you know, punched up with, you know, an essential oil or a, an extract or something, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. You know, the, the, the gummy bears that you, you referenced, that was actually kind of the culmination of working with, with poor one fruit purees. And, you know, most of that stuff is just out of the gate. It's color and flavor to make it taste like anything, you know, and, and when you're trying to adapt fruit purees, for example, to confectionery, you know, you have to ask yourself, well, what can be water? So instead of using water as my syrup for my base, I'm using fruit puree and I can start to then rely a little less on, on those, uh, those punch ups, you know, extracts and flavorings and what have you colors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, if, if it's going to make it taste better, yeah, I'll, I'll add a drop of bergamot oil, you know, with, with no no guilt. If you're trying to make it better, there's no guilt. Exactly. Yeah. If you're trying to be cheap, trying to rip people off, well, there you go. guilt. Yes. If you're trying to make it better, no guilt. Uh, John, what's your question? All right, so relatively basic, but I'm trying to make a chocolate mousse at the restaurant. <clears throat> so egg whites, uh, whipped cream, egg yolks, and I'm using 64% bittersweet dark chocolate uh, from Valrona, the Manjari from mm-hmm. Madagascar. Yeah. Yeah, it's really delicious. Um, basically, the problem I'm having, so whip the egg whites to stiff peaks, whipped cream to stiff peaks, melt the chocolate, and then uh, add the egg yolks. And basically when I do that, and so I'll also temper the egg yolks by adding the cho- a little bit of chocolate to the egg yolks, mix it up, and then start adding it back to the overall chocolate. But as soon as I do that, the chocolate completely seizes up, and then I'm unable to kind of mix it throughout the egg whites and whipped cream. And as it sets, I get like little chocolatey sure. chunks. In there. You're making yeah. chocolate chip mousse. Yes, exactly. Um, temperature of the eggs? Room temp. Had them setting up okay. for about an hour. Um, that's the first thing I would look at. I mean, there is water in egg yolk. Okay. You know, but I would think there's enough fat that you should be able to incorporate that to the chocolate. Um, work faster. Okay. Wow. All right. Fair. Wow. Yeah, okay. Ooh. <laughs> Dang. All right, John, who's on next week again? Uh, possibly Taraja Morel. If not, it is a No Tangent Tuesday. And then the following week, we have Rose Levy Birnbaum to talk about her new cookie book. Oh, amazing. Nice. I, did not, I did not know that. Yep. Amazing. I, you know, last time I saw her was, was on the street. It was in the document. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't read documents. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, 
You yeah, know, but Taraji is coming on next week, right, Stas? Yes. Yeah, All right, so that's it. Chance. So, but I'm going to try to get to some of these uh, questions that we have, including I spent this morning measuring my induction burner because uh, someone asked whether or not the induction burner can lift up. On the way out, because we're we're I got one minute left. Let's talk about you're a Detroit area. You're a Detroit area boy. Give I me am- some Detroit. Give me your favorite Detroit. You still have family there? Actually, I don't. I haven't been back to Detroit in at least five years. Um, wow, I didn't prep for that. Um, you know, it's I'll, I'll say this about Detroit. It's a weird place to visit, but it's a great place to be from. So if you're going to go, um, you need a car. There's no public transportation to speak of. And yeah, just hook up with a local because there's there's a lot of great sort of like hidden gems. You a beef heart chili man? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Beef heart chili. Cooking issues. 